choices that we have to make. We should put some perimeters within it so that we don't go outside and make mistakes. It has said so many beautiful things in this Bible, even in the book of um, what they call the New Testament. And it makes statements that I have to approve of it because as it says that the New Testament is truth, but it's strangely mixed. And it's true, it is, it's very strangely mixed. So, but when we see truth in it, we give attention so that we might be able to, as individuals, make our journey towards a, give, to give us a successful understanding of what we should be doing. It is said very plain, plainly in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Now I can approve, I approve totally of that because to prove all things and to hold, fa to hold fast to that which is absolute truth, then you're no longer a believer. It also says in the, in the New Testament, in the book of Philippines, chapter 2, verse 12. And I'm not going to read all of it, but the part that strikes me, it says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I can agree with that, that if we work out our salvation with trembling and fear, and that we would prove, this not believing anything, but truly prove it, and come into a perimeter by which we would use to prove who we are. The thing about it, it also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, gods and lords, there be many. So you have to choose your God and you have to choose your Lord. And as I said before, trying to come to what would we put so that we as we journey on, what would we put in place so it might make sense to us? For one, as we read what they call the Old Testament, you have to remember God never said it was old. God never said it was new. It was this what was put to give you a clarity that you're going from one book to another and that one that was considered old was supposed to be done away with and the one that was new it should be in place because of this the word new but that's not so because Yahweh God he never said one was old and he's never said one was new so how do we distinguish and how, how are we to get information from these two books that would help us to venture into our present life so that we may have stability. For one thing, when we, when, when, when this story opens up, if we have to choose anything, I would choose Genesis chapter 12. Because at Genesis chapter 12, um, Yahweh would talk to Abraham and he would explain and give him a greeting that he would make him a great nation and he would bless him and make his name great and he told him he should be a blessing and it goes also to say that to include all humanity he says and I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed now we're going to use this as our perimeter to come to an understanding of what this is about and how does it relate to us. As we go on in this story, we find, and I'm going to jump, make some real big leaps so we don't go through every page, that Abraham's Op name would be Change. And in so doing, he would be called Abraham. And his wife, would, that would be Sarai, would be called Sarah. 
And it would be promised that the land that he would possess would be an everlasting covenant to his seed. And, but he would have two kids, two children. And the first one would be Ishmael, and it's said in Genesis chapter 17, verse 19. And Allahimah said to Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. So the covenant that he would give to Isaac wouldn't be this a covenant, but it would be an everlasting covenant. And therefore, he also said, and as for Ishmael, I have heard thee, behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve prince shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee in this time, in the next year. So it, is, it, is, it has been set forward that Isaac would come forward from from them and, and therefore they would he would have the covenant an everlasting covenant but it would also go to go on so that we would have clarity to how this covenant will definitely emerge so that so that we can see how do we fit into this so being that Isaac is born and Abraham is given a charge to sacrifice Isaac and therefore in so doing Yahweh sees a loyalty that he never asks him why he never questions him because he was promised Isaac and in that it says in Genesis chapter 22 he says that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seas as the stars of heaven, and as the sands which is upon the seashore. And, and thy sea shall possess the gates of his enemies. So he's saying that when his sea is even in their enemies, whatever, they're going to be victorious. And in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed, because thou have, have obeyed my voice. So. If the nations are to be blessed, they ha it has to come through the seed of Abraham. It says the nations of the people cannot have a blessing, not on this earth. If their feet is on this earth and they're not going to bless the seed of Abraham, that, that a covenant would be made with what? Isaac. An everlasting covenant came down to Isaac. And therefore, when Isaac had gotten old, he would marry Rebekah. And therefore, Rebekah, and as I told you, I'm making some very giant leaps in the book. But I wanted to, to address the circumstances that, that w would occur with Isaac. Isaac would have the opportunity of, of having two sons and these two sons would be twins but they would have different mannerism because their path in the earth would be different that's why when Rebecca had the children in Genesis chapter 25 and she said if it be so why am I thus and she went to inquire of Yahweh. So she went someplace that she would get an answer. And Yahweh said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, two manners of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one person shall be stronger, stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. Now this was a decree by this was a decree that was made by Yahweh himself and therefore in so doing 
he 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 automatically established how things would work out so that in the long run people would say that Esau Esau that Jacob would rob his brother but that was not how it was really to be it was not played out that he was robbing anybody he was only taking his place as it had been prescribed by Yahweh God. And that's why Yahweh said, Your ways are not my ways, nor your understanding my understanding. He, may, he, meant, he mentions that. So then when people begin to question why did God do this thing or why he did that, that was irrelevant because it was what was to be done by Yahweh's word. And these two brothers would come for Isaac's blessing. Because as it said, honor thy father and thy mother that thy days might be long. They would come and he would get the blessing from his father. And they both received blessing. Isaac, because Rebekah remembered the prophecy that was given by Yahweh that the older shall serve the younger. She encouraged her younger son, which was Yaakov, Jacob, to put on certain things. Remember, Isaac's eyes had become dim, and he could not discern that easy. So he inquired as best he could and asked him, is your name, is you truly Esau? And he said he was. And at the same time, he was scared. That's why he told his father, his mother. He said, if my father, by some way, discern me, he's going to curse me. And she said, let that curse fall on me. But look, I heard the blessing from Yah. I heard the prophecy. You go in there. She didn't say this to him, but I'm saying that he, he she encouraged, Rebecca encouraged him to go in there because she knew that by that prophecy that was given to her by Yahweh, he would be successful. And, and not reading all through what he had said, but the blessing. When he blessed, when Isaac blessed Jacob, he says, Therefore, Allah will give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's son bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curses thee, and blessed be he that blesses thee. So we know that he had scarcely been gone, and his brother came. And when his brother came, which is Esau, he asked, he said, And Isaac his father said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. And Esau and Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that has taken venison and brought it me? And I have eaten of all before thy cometh, and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. And he could not hold back the money. He says, with certainty, it's going to drop, and there's nothing you can do about it. He is going to be blessed. In other words, he couldn't withdraw it. So we know that Isaac going down in Genesis chapter 27 I read 28 to 29 and I read 33 and I'm going down to 37 and Isaac answered and said unto Esau behold I have made him thy Lord and all his brethren have I given him for servants and with corn and wine I have sustained him, and what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said on his father, Has thou but one blessing, my father? Bless even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. He knew, but it wasn't as serious as he thought that he, I know he wanted to bless him, but it was in the family. His brother would have shared with him. You understand? The thing about it, it was a reason that Yahweh God would choose Esau 
to be one thing and Jacob to be another thing. And because Jacob got the blessing, it did not exclude Esau. If Esau would have showed his brother brotherly love. But let's go on and see. So Esau says, and he wept, and he says, And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, and of the dew of heaven from above, and by thy sword thou shalt live. So Esau lives by the sword. And Esau wasn't blessed to be a godly man. That's why he said, May the Alahims, when he opened up his blessing to what? Isaac. Isaac opened up his blessing to Esau. He said one thing, but Jacob, he, he started off, he says, what? Therefore the Elohim give thee of the dew of heaven. But Esau, he opened up and says, and Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. This by his very utterance of his word that he knew, but he could not give him the blessing of the gods. And he told him, he says, you're going to be a man that's going to live by trauma, affliction. You're going to afflict other people. You're going to do things to encourage discourse. That's why he said, thou shalt live by the sword. He said, anything you want, you're going to take you're going to plunder, you're going to rob, you're going to have nothing but chaos. That's how you're going to rule. And he goes on to say, and thou shalt serve thy brother. He said, with all that you do, you're going to still be rendered to serve your brother. No matter how devious with the sword you are. He said, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion, the total rulership. Thou shalt that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. He said, when you, when you have that total dominion, you're going to deal with your brother in another way. And he said to him in Genesis chapter 27, verse 41, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father is at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. So he, he had put it in his heart that he would do a miss, that he would do mischief to his brother in, in days to come somehow. But like I says, the New Testament is true, strangely mixed. It has some truth into it, and you just got to know how to enter into it, get what you want, and leave it alone. It also says in the book of Romans chapter 9 verse 11, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of Allah according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that call it. So it was by Yahweh's decree that this would be executed that way. So when people tell you that Jacob stole something, Jacob didn't steal anything. Jacob is the light of the world. And as we go here and we see his journey, the journey of Jacob that would go on would lead Jacob to the ultimate of his gift that he had received from his father. He, he would journey on and in his journey, he would receive a high blessing, and that blessing would be, his name would be changed from Jacob, what? To Israel. That's a high, that was a high blessing that he, that he would receive. And therefore, from that on, we begin to read of his children that would be born unto him after his name, and they would go down into Egypt. And his name would be changed. But let me read this. In Genesis chapter 32, verse 28. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with man, and has prevailed. So no matter what we get into, we're going to prevail. 
no matter how dark it looks, we're going to prevail. Because it's all coming to understand who we are. Now, we know that they would go down into Egypt. And into Egypt, they would be subjected to cruelty. And in the cruelty that they would be subjected to. And remember, Jacob would have sons. And they would be Reuben, Samuel, Levi, Judah, Ezekiah, Zebulon, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher. These are the souls that is mentioned in the first part of, of Exodus where they would go down into Egypt. And they would be oppressed in Egypt. And the, and the marvelous thing, Yahweh God would show them a respect where it says, when the Egyptians began to afflict them, and they really put a hurting on them. Just like when we, when we read in, in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and thou shalt go into Egypt again, identifying who we are so that we can have a connection to the prophecy and the history of this book. This is why we have to prove all things. I'm saying that the black American, the black American that came here, that was violently taken off the continent of Africa, that he was chased out of Jerusalem, that certain circumstances that had prevailed against him, that was so hideous because he had done so much wrong. Like I said, and I, I repeat again and again, how strange their truths in this book. There are many truths in the New Testament that has a light on what had transpired with us. We were in Jerusalem, and the last two tribes was Benjamin and Judah, and they fought a fight. But it was talked to, it was prescribed in St. Luke, chapter 21, verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down on the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. This is a truth that had occurred. And by the sword, they were led into all places on this planet. It's no, that is not a lie. That is the total truth. So what I'm saying, and I repeat again and again, the New Testament is true. It's just strangely mixed. And therefore, you have to have proof so that you might not vary from the perimeter of truth. And you have to set up the perimeter by which to measure this truth so you can prove all things. And as it says here, and in, 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 in coming to understand these things that they talk about, the man they call Christ, that was also from the tribe of Judah. He was a Judean. He was never a Christian, supposedly. But, like I said, it was mentioned that Israel would be a lost people as it says in St. Matthew, chapter 10, verse 6, but go rather to the lost house of Israel. In other words, Israel would be a lost group of people because he said go not after the land, after the people. They would be lost, trodden down, dislocated from their own habitat. And therefore, when we read this, we see a truth. Because when we go back and read into our book, we find that it has truth to it. And this is what I'm saying about the New Testament. It's truth but it's strangely mixed. And you'll hear me say that 
time and time again so that you won't get confused and pick up the wrong thing when you when you understand that these things that you see in this book you must prove it not just believe it but prove it you know are you are we israelites are we the children that this book is talking about because it told you that it would be trotting down underfoot. And we want to make sense of these things so that we don't fall by the wayside by misunderstanding. As it says in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 6, it told that my people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds has caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. So a people evidently was lost. And he said, my people. So how can we find my? My people. Because when it says, Yahweh God only had one people. He didn't, the world, he was God of the world. But he never got familiar with anybody other than the children of Israel. He said, he says, out of all the families of the earth, Israel, I've only known you. He never knew anybody else personally. He didn't invite the nations to his house. He didn't claim them as being his people. He claimed the children of Israel. Isaac, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3, the ox knoweth his owner. And the ass is master crib, but Israel does not know. My people does not consider. So Israel is Yahweh's people. It didn't say nothing about any organization, any religion. Yahweh started nations. Anybody can belong to a religion. He's talking about nationality. And therefore, we have to prove, is this true or it isn't? I'm saying that the perimeter must be, is this story that is talked in this Bible, is it about you? Is it about everybody? Is everybody? This is a history book of the children of Israel, their story in relationship to their God and what they had done. And therefore, when we look at this, we want to know how and what should we travel what should we do? We know the pain of studying this book that we had engaged in many mishaps by, by not keeping the commandments. And you have to prove this to yourself. If you are the children of Israel that have come into America that were sold as, on, on auction blocks and your family was torn from you, then you could not be a Christian. Because no Christian was ever sold. You understand? Nobody, they were sold in this country. There was never one European white man coming out of Europe that was sold on the auction blocks with chains as a nation of people that would be scattered and coming into the Western Hemisphere. They did not send slave ships to Europe to collect white people. It never happened that, that I know. Maybe they got another book, but the enslavement, not only it was captivity, enslavement, in prison, it was a brutal, and I mean brutal, nobody would ever believe that anybody could be treated so harshly when the people went and got them. But what did it say? That he hated his brother. And he says, the days of mourning for my father is at hand, and I shall slay my brother. So we have to give a description, being that we, who said that they would do so much harm to us? Our twin brother. And who would be our twin brother other than this man that is now in rulership in this country called Esau? That's his biblical name. No one has afflicted us more than he has. No one has been more harsher, more unforgiving. He has laid, he has totally 
laid with no pity because Yahweh God t told you this is how he would deal with you. He would not have no pity on you and he would be your brother. And when the, the descriptions that have been given, it fits him totally. It says he would cast off all pity. He would have no pity on his brother. In Amos chapter 1 verse 11, thus said Yahweh, for three transgression of Edom, because he had two names, Edom and Esau. And for four, I will not turn away the punishment. God says, I'm not going to turn away the punishment of Edom. He said, therefore, because he did pursue what? His brother. He didn't pursue, it wasn't a stranger. With the sword. He was given the sword. And did cast off all pity. And his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. He said, man, this ain't nothing going away. He has indignation for us forever. He will go in the grave hating us. Now, this it says here. That's why it says in the book of Obidah, Yahweh said, for the violence against thy brother, shame shall cover thee. He said, your violence... He didn't say slavery. He said the violence against thy brother. Shame shall cover you. Because they were un, it was unmerciful, ungiving what they had done to us and continue to do. It also says in, 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 in Isaiah 47 verse 6, I was wroth with my people. I have polluted my inheritance and given them into thy hands. Thou did show them no mercy upon the ancient, hast thou verily heavily laid thy yoke. In other words, man, there was no pity for us. Who was going to give us pity? He wasn't. There's no way he was going to be merciful to us. He had gotten us in his grip, and he was going to exercise full punishment with no mercy was he given. And Yahweh God complained the way Esau dealt with us. He dealt with us worse, and he was more kinder to people that never done him any good. He was kinder to strangers that he would give them your own, the things that you had earned. He would give them to them generously and invite them and give them your sweat and tears that you have sweat. And that's why Yahweh said in Zechariah chapter 1. And I am very sore displeased with the heathens that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased. And they heap forth the affliction. Yahweh said they heap forth the affliction. He said, I, you know, you got when you understand this story. It wasn't, it wasn't that we came here. Not to be punished. We came here to be punished, but they they dropped all their laws of protecting us, and they took total havoc on this black man in the United States of America. And he was the great emancipation of the American economy, the wealth of America. He lifted America up with his genius. He gave America, he emancipated America from total poverty and gave them methods by which they are the leading product, uh, they are leading in producing goods and services to the world. I mean, with the inventions that was given, we were a great participant in giving them that long leap and strive. How? Free labor. We gave them free genius labor. We were not only laborers, we were creators. And we created. And when we left, we left to have something for ourselves. Everybody should find a book called Black Wall Street. Go online, Google it in, and you'll find out. Black people in the United States have lived the American dream. They've lived it. But Esau, every time he got a chance, he tore it up. He wouldn't let, let us have any stability because this is Esau. 
I don't care what we do. He'll give us a church because he know it ain't going to help us. If he thought it was going to help us, we wouldn't get it. Yes, we sold drugs to each other, but somebody put it in our community because it was no good. If they thought drugs was going to help us, we wouldn't have never got it. But they have given us everything in our community. If you think these ministers are going to teach you the truth, keep going. You'll never learn it. And if they did, they'll shut them down. But see, you don't see that. Keep going. Don't be angry. We're not angry. Our God has told us everything we should do and what we should be about. And one of the things he told us, happier thou Israel for whose like unto thee. For thou shalt find thy enemies liars and you shall tread upon their high places. We're going to win this. We don't have to really say what. We, we in Egypt again. And thou shalt go into Egypt again. Deuteronomy chapter 28. You could not find your identity in the New Testament. If they gave you the New Testament, you'll never find out who you are. You're not just an African of the African continent. You're African by the African continent, but what, what part of Africa did you have? You mean you all those people? Well, then, guess what? If you all those people, you'll never find your way back home because you're too much of a mixture. And who would you apply yourself to? Would you say you're Ethiopian, Egyptian, uh, uh, Nubian? What would you say? The point is, is that you would have to go back and ask them, could they accept you? But being that you have read in this book and know you're an Israelite, you don't have to ask for no acceptance from <laughs> nobody. You know your way. And what has Yahweh told you? What has he told you if you're an Israelite? These are the things you must pick up. You are to keep the commandments, keep the shadow. You have to wrestle because many of us got to work. We got to pray to ask Yahweh, can we come into sync so that we can begin to do our holidays because we want to come into total harmony. So as we read this book, and like I said, and I'll say it again and again, that many truths in the New Testament is this that is strangely mixed. And therefore, you have to be very careful how you deal with it. Because we are totally in battle. We are in battle against some strange things. And therefore, we don't have to take it serious. It's a serious encounter that we are encountering because it was made mention what we would, it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's right. That's right. In other words, somebody <coughs> ain't dealing on a physical <coughs> level. They have employed witchcraft on a, high level. on a high level. It also says in the book of Revelation, chapter 18, it told them about what they had done. It says, um, um, Revelation 18. And the light of a candle shall, shall, shall shine no more at all in thee, and the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For the merchants were the great men of the earth, and by thy sorcerers were all nations to see. He said, man, they were working some witchcraft. He said, by the, the nation, all of them, this is in the book of Revelation, but let's go back into the book of Isaiah, because Isaiah speaks of this crafty, ungodly union that they would have with dark forces, and he told them, he told them, he says, in, in, in Isaiah 47, Verse 12. Um, stand thou with, with the enchantments and with my, you know, with the multitude, with the multitude of thy so, sorcerers, sorcerers, wherein 
die as Hazard labored, labored from thy young youth. youth, if so, but thou shalt be able to profit, 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 if so be thou may it prevail. prevail. He said to him, he said, look. Y'all, he told them, he said, stand now with thy enchantments, because this is what they be doing. Thy enchantments and with the multitudes of thy sorcerers. He said, it ain't a little bit of them, it's a lot of them. Wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. He said, you have been laboring this from the very first time. You've been involved in this witchcraft for the very first time. He said, from, from your youth. And he said, if so be, thou shalt be able to profit. If so be, thou mayest prevail. He said, it's going to come a time that that witchcraft and all that ain't going to work. He said, it ain't, he said, see if it going to work. That's what he's saying. He said, see, and he also goes to tell them. He said, thou art weary in the multitude of thy counselors. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and they have a lot of people looking at the stars, trying to find the circumstances that they can what avoid if possible. And he says, the monthly prognosticators stand up and, and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. He said, these things that are going to come upon thee, and he goes to tell them, he said, therefore shall evil come upon thee. Thou shalt not know from whence whence it rises, and mischief shall fall upon thee. Thou shalt not be able to put it off, and desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. He said these things that they look is going to come upon them so suddenly. They ain't going to be able to duck it. It ain't going to be gradually. It's going to come on to them so fast. And it goes from one book to another. In the book of Revelation, it tells the same story. Revelation chapter 18, it tells them because at, at, at um, Isaiah chapter 47, it goes on to say, For thou trustest in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, None seeth me. Thy wisdom and knowledge, it has perverted thee. See, yeah, because now they want to go to Mars. Yeah. They want to do all this stuff. Ain't nothing going to help them. Nothing going to help them because they have neglected the living God. Nothing is going to help them. I don't care where they run. Because Yahweh says, none see it. It says, and he says that, that they, their knowledge has perverted them. Thou have said in thy heart, I am and none else, else besides me. He says, nobody else is going to be besides him. He said, but these two things shall come upon thee in a moment. In one day, the loss of children and widowhood, they shall come upon thee in perfection for the multitudes of thy sorcerers and for the great abundance of thy enchantment. See, they've been chanting. They've been working this witchcraft. And all of it is going to boomerang on them because you can't get no blessing from the devil. The devil is going to deliver all their chanting, all what they have been doing. The devil going to come back and say, well, here's your blessing. Because you can only get fair punishment is to give you what you, get, what you have done. If you a murderer, you should be murdered. If you a thief, then you should get the same thing. You ain't going to have none. As you put other people in poverty, you're going to be in poverty. Because it has mounted up. You don't deserve anything. When, when Yahweh gives you back the punishment, the even punishment is to get back what you have done. Why? Because you wouldn't want it done to you. That's what it is. You don't want things. The same thing that the devil do to other people is never what the devil wants to himself. He wants to prosper. He going to steal your money so he can have money to do his his thing. But he wouldn't want the money stolen back from him, and he stole it. But if you know what I'm saying, how, how can evil look for good? 
Evil have to look for evil. That's why I say, say ye to the righteous that all shall be well, for he shall reap the fruit of his doings. The, the wicked man will, will reap the fruit of what he has done. The righteous man will reap the fruit of what he has done. There's no other way. You keep the commandments, the blessing is there. You can't keep the commandments and do evil, then you're evil. You're mixing righteousness with unrighteousness. You got a mixture there. And therefore, it's what you do continuously and perfectly. Since you have, have become lukewarm, then you get everything lukewarm. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen. Because you're not one-minded to keep the commandments. You're not even one-minded to do wickedness. You're going to mix it all together. You're going to use deceitfulness and righteousness. And therefore, as you have deceived, so shall you be deceived. If you ain't done right, what right can come to you? This like it says, and the devil has what? Transformed himself in the angel of, of light. Why? Because he's ugly. Evil is ugly. Evil is not pretty. Evil is ugly. It dresses itself up because nobody would participate with ugliness. And therefore, it disguises itself. It makes itself pleasant so it can come among you. So may Yahweh bless you and may Yahweh keep you and may the things that your God has blessed you with, may you enjoy immensely knowing that you are Israel and return to him and keep his commandments.